DPM, thank you very much indeed. We have about 30 minutes before um, you get your main course. Um, and there are already some big questions coming in here, but I'd like to pick you up, pick up uh, very quickly on what you said at the beginning. But before I do, let me remind you what the address is, if you haven't written it down, pigeonhole.at slash SS2017, because this makes it a more efficient way of, uh, of getting questions tabled. When you talked about where we want to take ourselves, DPM, let me put it to you actually that it's difficult now to do that kind of thing. Where you want to go is not necessarily where geopolitics and the new realities are taking you. Here we've had today yet another launch of a ballistic missile by the North Koreans, not from a remote site, but from a site very close to Pyongyang, the capital. And it went further and higher than anyone has seen from a North Korean missile before, beyond uh, into the sea, beyond Hokkaido. And then the Japanese have launched two ballistic missiles as well. Now, I come back to that question, where we want to take ourselves, but how does Singapore assert itself when other things are happening in ways which probably you're almost too fearful to predict? <laughs> well, Singapore has always tried to work in partnership with others. We know that we're too small to influence countries on our own. So our approach has always been to make good friends, to form networks, and then to create these partnerships to move in the direction that we want to go. But we have to know where we want to go first before we can actually start moving. And hence, I wanted to just frame the discussion that we have today. So even if you look at North Korea and its missiles, North Korea is clearly an outlier in the Asia Pacific and in the world. It's one of the last vestiges of the Cold War. So the question is, can North Korea carry on on its trajectory? It has done so for a number of years, but eventually I think that good sense will have to prevail. How much are you feeling the strains here, though, whether within the UN Security Council, the international reaction, the complexities of the, the Russian and Chinese responses to this, but also more broadly what's happening with Japan and what's happening elsewhere? I think for the North Korean situation, I don't think any of the countries really wants to go to war, not even North Korea. The big danger is with all the posturing and with big weapons, on hair triggers, that accidents can happen. But you can feel those stresses within, in your relations with other nations around this region, can you? I think everyone is concerned about it, but I think we all should take a rational approach to it. I mean, if we start to take precipitate actions, then we may end up with an undesirable result. Could rational be the wrong approach <laughs> to irrational, though? Um, I don't say that facetiously. Yes. I mean... I, I studied mathematics like all of you. My, two minuses, you multiply, you get a positive. But I don't think two irrationalities create a rationality. I, I don't think that, 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 that identity holds. <laughs> do, do keep some more questions coming. I've got several here already. But can I ask you about relations with China? Because obviously after the decision on the South China Sea last year, how would you define your relationship with China? Because when you say where you want to take yourselves, there are new realities which have come in, helped by the, the adjudication on the, on the South China Sea, which have added new stresses for Singapore. Well, I think our relations with China are actually very good. They're more than in good working order. We work together in a whole range of areas. Uh, I myself chair three uh, rather unusual councils and committees with the Chinese. One is the JCBC, the Joint Council for Bilateral Cooperation, which largely covers uh, economic areas. But I also chair an annual meeting with Minister Zhao Lezi now, who is the Minister for the Central Organization Department of the Communist Party of China. And he's responsible for leadership development in China. And we have a very useful exchange in how we can prepare our public sector leaders to face the new world. The third uh, committee that I chair together with them is with uh, State Councilor Meng Teng Tzu. And he is in charge of the Legal Affairs, Political and Legal Affairs Commission. 
And then they're interested in how to uh, also reform their system, their legal systems, their laws, how they conduct relations uh, between state and society in order to develop their, their, their polity and to take that country forward. There are those who wonder after the real politic of what happened with the, the um, adjudication on the South China Sea, who wonder if, if China is actually marginalizing Singapore and focusing in many other areas through um, the Belt and Road Initiative and not discarding Singapore, but not maybe working with Singapore as precisely and warmly as has been the case in the past. Well, our relationship with China cannot be the same as in 1990. It's different. I mean, in 1990, China was almost an international pariah because of the Tiananmen incident. But that did not stop us. We saw China's potential, China's growth, and we engaged China and worked with them. Today, China is an enormous power, economically, militarily, it understands the world better. It engages at every level. So the role that we can play with China is a different one. How do you define it? I tell my Chinese friends that we don't hope to be the biggest investor in China, though we are one of the biggest investors in China. In fact, I think we're the biggest source of investment in China apart from Hong Kong. And Hong Kong is part of China. It's quite remarkable. For a small country like Singapore, we're the biggest source of investment for China. The role that we can play, actually, is as a pathfinder. If there's something different that China wants to do, we can work together with China to experiment on that. So our third government-to-government -government project in Chongqing, in the western part of China, is a very good example of that. Chongqing lies in a region which has got enormous potential, but it's inland, and it's got enormous logistics problems, and the Chinese want to solve that. And the project that we have with China there is an integral part of their Belt and Road project, and also a part of the project that they have for developing the whole Yangtze River region. And we have just recently been talking to the Chinese. My colleague um, has been in Chongqing, and several provinces in China have signed up to create a land link between Chongqing and Guangxi, which brings a land link which is entirely within China, from western China in Chongqing down to the sea in Guangxi, and will provide a much shorter transportation route. Let me, a question which has just literally come in as you were talking. I'm going to read it as it's written, but it, you can see where this is going. How can Singapore avoid ending up in a similar situation that Qatar finds itself in, in the Gulf? And I'm trying to uh, interpret that as if, as if to say, look at what's happened between Qatar and several of the Gulf states led by Saudi Arabia. It's led to a massive draining of their, of their national reserves, their, their, their wealth fund and so on. It's suddenly become a very serious issue, something that's been lingering for a long time. Could you envisage Singapore's wealth being suddenly affected in that kind of way? Well, I would say that the issue with Qatar is not a sudden one. I mean, it's an issue which has been there for quite a number of years. I mean, not so long ago, the, several of, the, of its uh, Arab neighbors uh, also, had also withdrawn the ambassadors from Doha. And that was already a signal. I think that was about half a dozen years ago already. So there were tensions there. The tensions got ex exacerbated by differences over things like um, the situation in Egypt, the situation in ISIS, and there were very major differences of views. And so that's the situation in Qatar. We hope that we will never end up in that situation with our neighbours. Is this a, a, almost an unthinkable and unpalatable which you didn't think about, or you could see now that these, this is the new realities of what's coming down the track in ways which you could never predict. As a small country, nothing is unthinkable for us. So we think of all the possible dire things that can happen to us, and we try and plan for them, and we try and look ahead so that we can avoid them if possible. Have you got a list of ten for tonight? <laughs> no, I don't. But Mr. Goh is smiling because that's what... He, as Prime Minister, also imparted to all of us. <laughs> we always look ahead 
and try and navigate out of trouble. Keep the questions coming. Uh, a lot of anonymous questions, I have to say. That's, I think, because of the, uh, the pigeonhole way of doing things. How can a technologically superior China keep the re region safer and richer, especially as the USA retreats even further into itself? Well, that's why I wanted to speak and frame the discussion today and say that what we hope to achieve is an open, inclusive architecture for the region, for security as well as for economics. And we, th we believe, we sincerely believe, that this is the best architecture for countries big and small. So countries as small as Singapore, and countries as large as China, the United States, and India. And we hope that the Chinese themselves will believe this. And China has indeed benefited from an open, inclusive architecture in the region. And I think for its future prosperity and for future security and stability in the region, that is what we should all aim for. And given it's only a few months since uh, um, President Trump made his statement about TPP, and you mentioned that uh, in, your, in your remarks, what about the recalibrating of TPP? Help us understand the Singaporean view of where you think TPP is going. Is it less cohesive than it was? Can you see problems on the horizon? Reassure those out here in the audience, the delegates? Well, let me explain the TPP and compare it to the RCEP, the regional... Um, economic, uh, regional, all, all the spaghetti uh, abbreviations, the TPP and the RCEP. The TPP is actually a partnership of the willing. Those countries which felt that they want to come together and have an ambitious free trade arrangement came together. <clears throat> and it started out the P4. <clears throat> a few countries, Singapore, New Zealand, I think Chile, Brunei started there and it expanded. The RCEP starts with ASEAN and its partners. So the membership is fixed. And so when you negotiate that, you have to negotiate that trying to satisfy all those individual partners that will come into the RCEP. So the, the negotiation dynamics are very different. So the TPP moved a lot faster and it's a much more ambitious um, <coughs> arrangement than the RCEP. But for the TPP, with the withdrawal of the US, it does change the calculus because a number of countries were prepared to put things on the table because of the attraction of the US market. And I know that my colleagues in the Ministry of Trade and Industry and our colleagues elsewhere, I was just in Australia a few days ago, are looking at this in great detail to see whether the remaining benefits continue to be worthwhile for us to proceed. And a case can be made for that, but also we do understand that there are countries who will have difficulties. Let me just see if I can interpret that. Are you saying skepticism, the need to recalibrate, the need to reconsider? Is that what you're saying? You mean TPP or for all or for countries? For, for Singapore and TPP. Uh, we are prepared to go ahead with TPP as a TPP minus. We are quite clear about that. Uh, for us, we are in a, quite an unusual position because if you do all the calculations for TPP and you just look at the cost-benefit matrix from a trade point of view, actually, we are one of the smallest beneficiaries from the TPP because we are already so open. And we already have bilateral trade agreements with many of the countries. We have a US FTA. We have, an F, we have a FTA with China. We have FTAs with many of these countries. So, and we have F, FTA with the Japanese. The Chinese, of course, are not in TPP. But we already have FTAs with all of them, so the additional benefit to us is not as great as the benefit to many of the other countries. So why are we so keen on TPP? It's because of that catalytic effect that it will have on free trade in the region and setting a good benchmark for free trade arrangements. Let me see if anyone out there very quickly wants to come in on TPP. You're burning and you can't be bothered to, you, to use a keyboard. Does anyone want to come in using a microphone quickly on TPP? I can't see any hands going up. Is there anyone? No, not at the moment. Okay, well, come back to me if you want to, because we haven't finished that area. If you want to come back, 
on this uh, critical issue for this whole region. We've if, got, I, if I may add one point on TPP. So if you were just to look at the trade calculus and do the numbers based on a cost-benefit matrix, based just purely on the trade calculus, then you'll come up with, a, with one answer. But if you overlay on top of that trade calculus what kind of region you want to see in the long term and a strategic calculus, then you come up with a different answer. And I hope that the countries will be able to put on that additional layer on that matrix and look at TPP in a broader sense. I've got two questions here about India. Um, we've just seen Mr. Abe, Prime Minister Abe of Japan uh, in India, uh, announcing with Modi that um, they're going to build an enormous uh, well, high-speed train, which in <coughs> India is quite extraordinary, yes. uh, from Mumbai up to Ahmedabad, which of course is Gujarat, which is uh, Mr. Modi's um, home state. But uh, one question here from Jashanka, what is your outlook towards India? What are some key indicators that would suggest India has developed to the next level? Would you expect large investments from Singapore, like uh, in China uh, a few decades ago? In other words, your calibration of India and its, um, its status. It, two, two years ago, we had Mr. Jetley, the finance minister, sitting in this chair at exactly this point, talking about the outlook for GST and so on. So things are moving very fast, um, less than two years before the next election in India. What's your calculus? Well, we are very enthusiastic about India. We have a very good relationship with India. In fact, we were, we were the country, Mr. Goh is again smiling, that brought India in as a partner to ASEAN. And Mr. Goh, I think, was the one who coined Indian fever or India fever as a part of our approach to India. And I think he described it very well. He said that the region needs two engines on its aeroplane to fly properly. One side is China, and the other side is India, and we will fly more stably and go further and, and faster with two engines. And I think that's absolutely correct. And this is the approach we've taken. So when India opened up, and this was whew, 15 years ago, around that, we invested. We were one of the first investors in Bangalore, in the IT parks. And we are still investing in India in southern India, in a fairly major development there. So we're working very, very actively with our Indian friends. Do you feel a power shift underway because of the, how can I put it, the assertiveness of Prime Minister Modi and the way India is moving in that very self-confident way at the moment? I think that is to be welcome. You feel it as well? I think it is to be welcome because, I mean, if I, with apologies to my Indian friends, I mean, sometimes the pace of can be a little bit faster for things in India. But I, I, we, we do understand that India does face uh, many, many um, uh, sort of domestic challenges in its politics, in its legal system, and so on. But the pace can be a little faster, and I think we do find uh, Mr. Modi's activist approach a very encouraging thing. What did you think two weeks ago, the extraordinary agreement actually between China and India right up on the northern border um, where they've been at war for a long time or in a state of frozen war, the fact that there was some kind of agreement. I was with one of the Indian ministers of state and he said that this was extraordinary. What did you read into that given you're talking about two countries of 1.3 billion, 1.4 billion in conflict in very remote areas, Arunachal Pradesh and, and Ladakh? suddenly coming to that kind of agreement at this point. What does that mean for this region? Well, I, I was just getting the inside story from the Prime Minister of uh, Bhutan just now because uh, this uh, dispute between uh, China and India actually arises from a dispute between a territorial dispute between China and Bhutan. And that area is a very sensitive area for India because it uh, overlooks the Siliguri Pass, which is uh, the chicken snack between the main subcontinent of India and the northeast of India. It's a very, very narrow uh, valley, and this part, Doklam Plateau, overlooks that valley. And there's a disputed area. The Chinese were building a road coming very close to that area. The Prime Minister was telling me that it's at 5,500 metres, and within a space of 25 kilometers, 
it drops down into the valley and overlooks that very strategic valley. So the Indians were a little bit upset by this. But I'm glad that these two big countries were able to see the larger picture. Both of them decided that it is in the interest of each of their countries, and I hope for the larger region that they should disengage and pull back. I think the fact that uh, Mr. C was about to host Mr. Modi at the BRICS conference uh, helped a little too. Such is life. Yes. Maybe I didn't push this far enough. So I've had another question here about Singapore and China. How can Singapore continue to be relevant to China, yet, quote, manage, unquote, China's increasing aspirations and overseas relations? How do we avoid pitfalls like the ones Hong Kong and Taiwan face? We being Singapore. Well, as I said, I think for Singapore, we have to be realistic. <clears throat> We're not looking to be the biggest, the largest, or whatever it is when we engage China. So it is, you know, we're almost bemused by the fact that we're the largest source of foreign investment into China. Where we can play a role for China is to be a useful pathfinder, where there are things which are China wants to try, wants to experiment with, and it makes sense for us, and we have some experience, we can work with China and do that. So we did that in several phases of China's growth. When we did the Suzhou Industrial Park in the early 1990s, that was a phase in which China was industrializing and didn't quite know how to build an industrial park well. Today, China can build industrial parks better than anybody else. So that phase is over. When we went to work with China in Tianjin in the eco-city, in the 2000s, China was interested in building an environmentally friendly city and township. So we went in and worked with them, and we learned together. And now China is working on developing the West, and it's not hardware-based, but it's software-based. How do you get different regions to work together, overcome the, 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 the logistics problems, but not just the physical logistics problems, the paperwork between moving things around and so on. And so this is where we're working with China. So this is the way in which I think we can continue to be relevant to China. But we are not like Taiwan or Hong Kong. Taiwan and Hong Kong are part of China. We are not part of China. We are an independent country in Southeast Asia with a multiracial population. And we have to exploit the strengths of that diversity in our population and the strength of our position in the middle of Southeast Asia at the crossroads between China and India and Australasia in the South. Let me bring together three questions <coughs> here, uh, and I'm interpreting them here. That there's a concern that Singapore, the little red dot as it's described in one question, um, is actually going to become smaller, even if it remains very, um, uh, very successful as an economic entity and a political entity for all the reasons that you've established over so many decades now, that actually you're going to be marginalized by the Belt and Road Initiative simply because of the financial and political power and determination of China. You won't lose out, but actually China is going to take much more. And I'm, as I say, I'm, I'm paraphrasing several questions of concern here. Well. China is such a strong and growing economy, and India will be too. And they can eat everybody's lunch. <laughs> I mean, you're talking about low-cost manufacturing. We used to be a low-cost manufacturer. When I grew up, we were making shoes and clothes and, and, uh, and fishing reels and, and, and so on in the industries in Singapore. But we moved on two or three generations already. China has also moved on from these. They're now in the high-tech arena. The biggest manufacturer of drones in the world, by far, is a Chinese company, DJI. They're investing in solar panels, solar industry. They're building electric cars. So it's not an issue of just Singapore. But herein lies where being small has its advantages. Because we can change faster, we can move faster. 
and we have to find new areas of competitiveness and new areas of competence and new ways of making ourselves relevant. Thank you. Uh, does anyone want to come in using the microphone? We've got a six or seven minutes left. Do please just put up a bit of paper or get attract attention because I, you know, I'm conscious that you're all sitting there very docile except those who are sending me lots of messages. Um, DPM, <laughs> let me push one sure. other area. You're, in, you're coordinating national security, which tends to assume the kinetic stuff out there the kinetic stuff of weaponry and so on, and the kind of things we've seen today with DPRK and elsewhere, and what happened to the US warship recently, uh, obviously, which was an accident. But um, I want to push you further, because we're seeing this in, in, in Europe at the moment. Security is not just about warfare. It's actually about social stability. Uh, it's uh, actually about the, the tension of jobs and skills. And it's the worry that's emerging in so many countries now about whether stability can be retained by the political class in a time of such dramatic change where it's really a challenge to the societal fabric. And that in its own way is also a national security issue which probably is not uh, underscored adequately. What's your view? Well, you talk about the political class. And in fact, if you do have a political class which has become distinct and separated from the electorate, you have a problem. You, do you see that happening more and more? I think in some countries that may well have taken place. But I spoke a little about to this point uh, in my opening remarks. And that is, I think if you look at free trade and integration with the world, there is no doubt at all that it has increased prosperity for hundreds of millions of people around the world. I mean, China is a good example. India is a good example. Vietnam is a good example. We are a good example. Even America is a good example, where free trade has brought prosperity and benefits to America. Now, where, is, where does the problem lie? The problem lies in the distribution of those benefits. There were winners and there are losers within the individual countries and economies. And you have to work in your own country and in your own society to try to bring everybody up. Do you see a certain blindness to that reality? Uh, I think perhaps not blindness, but a certain inability to act and sometimes a little bit of helplessness. And this is what we've been trying to do to overcome in Singapore. So this year, in January this year, the Committee for the Future Economy made its report. And it looked at what we are going to do is we are setting up 23 industry transformation maps which cover the 23 sectors of the economy, which is 80% of our GDP. And we are going to work at uplifting each of these economic sectors. Not just the companies, but the workers as well because there will be mismatch in skills. The workers may have to learn new things for that industry, or workers may have to move from one industry to another and be retrained. So coupled with the industry transformation maps, we have a whole movement called Skills Future. And working in this way, we hope to uplift the economy, but at the same time, take care of our workers so that those who have to move will not be left alone and without jobs and without future. Because I was very struck by um, the Sea Trade Conference here in Singapore back in April when your Minister for Infrastructure and Transportation said to all the gathered maritime, um, those, the big figures in the maritime business, you're way behind. You've got to understand that life is changing very quickly. You've got to skill, reskill, and reskill again. Yes. And if you don't, this is going to have dramatic impact on the stability of your business and further afield. I, I completely agree with you. But we're not only looking at skills. There are two other parts to our economic strategy. And one part is to invest in research, innovation and enterprise. I happen to be the chairman of the National Research Foundation. And over, the next, over this five-year period, up to 2020, we're putting in 19 billion Sing dollars, so it's about what, 13, 14 billion US dollars in research, innovation, and enterprise. And basically, 
We want to catalyze a knowledge economy and entrepreneurs and new businesses. So not just trying to transform old businesses. And the other part which we are trying to leverage on in a major way is the digital economy. We are making a big push on Smart Nation to lay down the framework in which uh, the whole economy can operate much, much more efficiently, connect up with the rest of the world, and at the same time, open up opportunities as well for industry to provide new services and new products based on that. I've got two more questions and then it's time for the main course, um, which really builds on what we were talking about, or you were talking about with social stability. Uh, just in here, what's your view on Singapore having a credible opposition party, a sign of progress in a maturing country? How soon do you see this happening in Singapore? Well, this is a dilemma in a democratic society. You say when you change the government, that's a sign of progress. But actually when you change a government, that's a sign of failure. Why do you change a government unless you're unhappy with it? <laughs> right? So if a, if a government is successful and is doing its job well, why are you changing it? So the most important thing is that governments must be able to remain relevant, be able to earnestly serve the people well, be competent, be compassionate, be corruption-free. And does 2011 and what happened in that election, is that a shadow six years later which still hangs heavily over the government? Well, uh, I've been in politics now for 25 years. And I've seen ups and I've seen downs. And certainly for the ruling party in Singapore, the People's Action Party, we take every election seriously and the messages that we get from the electorate in every election very, very seriously. And we work at them and we try and improve all the time. And we also try and bring in new people so that we can continually regenerate ourselves and make sure that a new generation of leaders can reach out also to a new generation of voters. Well, finally, that it's a question which actually was the first one to come in. But I'm leaving it to this point because you've actually led to it, uh, DPM, from Rebecca, a name as well. How do you think the government can better bridge the gap between government officials and the next generation? How do we comfortably have coffee with you without being politically correct? Well, I have done this, this is with government officials or with citizens? Uh, how do you... How do you bridge the gap? How would you encourage the gap to be bridged between government officials and the next generation? A suggestion that really the next generation feels locked out of a process when actually it's the future of Singapore. Well, if I were not here tonight, I would be in my constituency doing my constituency clinics where I see about 60 to 100 people a week. And that's how we try to keep in contact with our younger people as well. But she's I, suggesting it's not quite enough. It's never enough. And I agree with her. It's never enough. Three quarters of the people who are helping me to help other people in my constituency are young people below the age of 30. And I make it a point when I visit my residents, and I visit them once a week, once every two weeks, I visit my residents. When I see the fathers and the mothers will come to the door, the older children, the, the grown-up children usually are doing their own thing. So I always ask to see them. I said, where are your son and daughter? Ask them to come and say hello. And I'll talk to them and I'll ask them to come and join me. Good. Come and help me build the country. And that's the best way to engage the young people. Give them a mission, give them ownership, help build the country. Well, Rebecca would like to come have coffee with you. Sure, anytime. <laughs> come up and I'll sign you up straight away. <laughs> Rebecca. Come and talk to the DPM. DPM, thank you very much. Thank indeed. you very much. It's time for the main course. Thank you. Thank you.